Resurrection Day for this one. Good morning, everyone. Wherever you are around uh, this country, wherever you're watching, whether you are at home, you are a member, you may not be well today, but we pray that the Holy Spirit will be with you and give you comfort and healing. And uh, we are so glad that you can be part of our church service today. This is more than just a church service. This is worship at its best, isn't it? How many of you feel like saying, thank you, Jesus, for bringing me through this week? Can they see your hand? Oh, God has his grateful people. And I'm so grateful to you. you know, there are many different ways by which we can praise God. Today is an exceptionally unique one. With you is Avondale Band. They have been around, they tell me, for over 100, well, around 100 years. None of them look that old. <laughs> but they have morphed in through the decades of history into different name, but they are still ministering to the Avondale and the community and the country churches. And I have been in one of those churches as a pastor, and they have surrounded us. They take up the whole space, and what a wonderful time it was. We are looking forward to have you bless us today. Avondale Band with Brother Fred as their conductor, with Steve there, and Peter, and Julianne, and David Heiss, and Esther, and Breeze, and his wife Rosalie, who's going to sing for us today. Lovely to have you again here. We have Luke and Kevin and John and Clancy. Clancy, have I got it? Neil, of course, and Barry and Caden and Lachlan and Lachlan and Mike and David Paul and Lou and many others. And I'm talking about the instruments. <laughs> Welcome. We're looking forward for you to bless us today. So just a few announcements before we have a few more after me. This is for you all. You are cordially invited to join us for a brand new week of prayer, which will be run on Zoom this week, starting Sunday evening at 7.30. We would love to have you join us for this week of prayer. You will be doing it from the comfort of your own home. You will be listening to some special items. You will be praying, should you want to, or others will pray with you. If you need a link, just it's there on the Facebook. Right there, you will find the link to our prayer group. It is fit and chat, the usual link that we have for our prayer meetings. So please come. It will be wonderful to come on Sunday evening, this at 7.30, and see over 150 faces on the screen. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Come and join us for the week of prayer this coming Sunday. And now I'd like you to remember that today is October 22. Does this ring a bell in Adventist circles? Oh, it's a great day of expectation, right? <laughs> Not the other way around. A great day of appointment with God. So today our World Church has prepared a program for us to watch today at 2 o'clock. You'll be able to look at that there in the dining room during our lunchtime. A special transmission at starting at 2 o'clock, which you can follow later on at home as well, should you need to. Again, the link is there on the Facebook. But I would like to just play a little clip where the World Church promotes this Sabbath today. So it is a special time for us to be alive 188 years after the great day. taste of what's coming up this afternoon and remember week of prayer this coming week and we will finish on friday with a little meeting here at the church bell you have something to remind us and sue please come i just want to remind you
you that it's not very far away to Road to Bethlehem. It'll be the December 11, 12 and 13. And we want you all to attend if you can't be involved. If you do want to be involved in something from drama to helping, come and see me if you can want to attend. Tickets will be on sale in two, uh, about two weeks, about mid-November. But just before um, I sit down, I just want to say also that my history with the Bash goes way back. My brother played in it for many years, but two of them in there taught me, one in primary school and one at college, so I'll leave you to guess who. band, the Adventist band in Brisbane and um, he was a little bit embarrassing actually because <laughs> they used to play at this school f um, fun day, the Adventist, Jenny do you remember the Adventist um, fun days that they had at the school and they always had the brass band there and my dad never took a hat and so he'd be out there with a handkerchief tied on corners on his head because it was so hot on his bald head. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, he also used to tell my mum that he had bandsman's lips, so I'm not sure what that meant, but <laughs> we've got five kids in our family. Um, now, I just want to know, oh, I just want to ask you guys, um, what, oh, first I want to ask you, have you guys enjoyed the socials so far that we've had this year? Is that everybody saying yes? Yes? Okay, can anyone tell me when the next one is? Ooh. Very good. What is it? Very good. But it's something actually a little bit more in there. I think it's actually called a food festival. <laughs> okay. So, do you know what the time is? Seven. Very good. And now the next question is, before I put the brochure up on the big screen, tell me what is going to be there. Food what? Food stalls for you to buy your dinner. What else? Uh, yes. Games, yes. Anything else? Yes. Oh, yes, cultural dances and karaoke. And I think there's one more. And if they have dairy-free, vegan and sugar-free, I'll participate. Can you tell me what it is? No, it's a food contest, food eating contest. <laughs> so, okay, Jacob, you can pop that slide up now. So you guys did actually very well remembering what is on there. Um, I actually just want to go through a little bit of Australian cuisine. Um, first I'll get, before I do that, I'll get you to all stand up who is actually not from Australia originally. dust. <laughs> okay, have you all been in contact with Rose? Have you? No? Well, down the bottom, down, down the bottom there is a phone number to contact Rose. Oh, where is it? There is actually on the original one. I'm actually going to give you a phone number. If you've got your phones or a piece of paper, write down 0450 745 654, which is Rose's phone number, because she's the one, she's the driving force behind this one. And it's 0450 745 654. Oh, and all you can call pasta to register some international food. So I actually was thinking, what is Australian? Because, come on, a lot of us are Australian and we're actually um, just as cultural, culturally acceptable as other people. <laughs> so I actually looked up, yeah, I make a mean nut meat pie with um, mushy peas. Um, I actually was a bit surprised actually. The Australian Mint last year put out in October some $1 coins that could actually be um, purchased with um, every letter of the alphabet being represented by an, um, an Australian icon. And Ice Vovos made it onto that, Vegemite, 
we fix. Um, and there are a couple of, there are a lot of other things right through to the end of the alphabet. So Arnott's biscuits, any of the Arnott's biscuits are actually an Australian icon and piece of food, and I reckon we could actually put some Tim Tams out. Um, Lemmington's, this one's a good one. Caramel Slice originated in Australia, and we've got the queen of caramel slices here. In <laughs> Does anyone know who that is? Wendy. <laughs> I think Wendy's away, though. Um, fairy Bread, who would have thought? Pavlova. The Aussie Barbecue with a snag. I'm sure we could rustle up a vegetarian one. Chico Rolls. Cherry Ripes. The Golden Gay Time Ice Cream. Oh, that sounds good. Freddo Frogs and Caramello, Caramello Koalas. Twisties and Cheezels. The Bowen Mango. Does there anyone know which one the Bowen Mango is? It doesn't seem to be sold in the shops as Bowen Mangoes anymore, but still there. Kensington Pride. Does anyone know that? Um, Milo originated in Australia in 1934 and two new ones in recent years that nobody else has got and the boys up the back actually told me what they were this morning. Does anyone know a coffee that was originated in Australia or a style of coffee? What's that? Yes. <laughs> And also McCafe. Apparently uh, McDonald's, um, even America, doesn't have a McCafe like we do. Anyway, that's, um, I hope that we have an Australian stall at the International Food Festival. <laughs> and I wonder what we're going to have on it. So anyway, it'll be great to see everybody there, 7pm next Saturday night.
morning, everyone. What a delight it is to be here in the church this morning and to welcome you beyond and to welcome you here to, to church. Um, we delight in actually traveling all over the conference. It's uh, such a, a wonderful thing for us to be involved in making music and, and taking that music to as far as, as Gunnedah and the likes of Tamworth or, or even as far as Port Macquarie or even as far south as Wollongong sometimes. And everywhere in between, wherever we get an invitation and we're able to sort of fit it in and it's such a delight. We just um, trust that as you worship with us today, that the music and the meditation on the music takes you to a wonderful place where you just draw closer to God. The, the hymn we just played then um, by Bokel is a, is a wonderful reflective piece written um, in the, in the 70s, somewhere there. We think it was actually written. And the composer, a Dutch composer, um, reflecting on, I guess, the history of Europe and so on, growing up through all of the turmoils of war and everything else. And here is this really rich hymn that really just speaks so well to um, the pathos and, and thinking and reflecting on life itself. So we hope that uh, you're able to enjoy the music that we bring today and that it's able to really enhance your worship of our Creator today. And Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. together.
Father, we thank you ever so much this morning that you are our God who lives in heaven, that you are the one who has his eye over the whole universe. What an honour and a privilege it is to sing to your name's honour and glory this morning. We thank you that we're here at Gosford today, and I pray that you'll bless every head bowed before you, and for those who are watching to the uttermost parts of the earth that they too will be richly blessed even as we are. And so, Lord, I pray that you will find our worship acceptable to you on this Sabbath day, for which we thank you because you are the great creator. And today we live in the memory of that first Sabbath. And may it not be very long before we will spend our first Sabbath in your kingdom. And I pray today too for those who are remembering the great disappointment so many years ago and here today on that very anniversary I pray Lord that you will give us the great not disappointment but appointment with you and that we can introduce others to that too I pray and so take us now keep us in your love and your care we pray please in Jesus precious name for your sake and for ours amen and amen <coughs> Now the offering today is for what, was it Val, who was talking about the things that this church does and uh, last week I was out west at Canamble and uh, lo and behold they've got a great 40 foot container there filled with food, so they have food bank out there and, uh, and you do many things. And this offering that's taken up today will go toward helping to spread that kind of work. And so the offerings, uh, the uh, deacons, we invite you to come forward. 
and take up the offering. Thank you. For brass bands around the world, the Salvation Army has been one of the great offerings in terms of brass band arrangements. Some of the greatest brass bands are, in fact, the Salvation Army. I suppose a significant proportion of our music uh, is, is Salvation Army. We have a great deal to thank them for.
Unfortunately, their attachment to brass bands is starting to wane. The money is being pulled out of it, and I just have no idea why. But anyway, we have a lot of the music. This particular piece is called Share My Yoke. Um, solo by Julianne Heiss. And again, it is a Salvation Army piece. I think we have some words to go with it. The words, in fact, were written well after the piece was composed as a, as a cornet solo. I think you'll enjoy it. Share my yoke, Solus Julian Heiss. It's time for the children to come down the front. And while you're coming, I've got a box of toys that I'm going to get. So you can come down and join me somewhere over here.
coming through this one? Oh, I think I'm coming through now, Neil. Yep. Do any of you collect anything? Do you have a collection? What do you collect? You collect rocks. I know you do because they come home in your lunchbox. Do you collect? Sticks and shells. Shells are a very good thing to collect. I do like that. They can be really good colours, can't they? Does anyone collect anything else? Yeah? You collect more things. Colourful paper. Colourful things are fun to collect. And actually, the things that I collect are also colourful, or at least a little bit more colourful than you expect. Because some time ago, I needed to split a lot of firewood. And so I went down to the hardware sh shop, and I got myself a log splitter. Have you seen one like this? This is just like an axe. It's a little bit heavier. It's a little bit wider. And it's good for splitting. Yeah? On that side, it looks like a hammer. That's right. Technically, this is a maul because you can actually hit the back of it if the log is really, really hard to split. But can you see, I said it was colourful. It's not as colourful as it was when it was new. Can you see it has an orange handle, orange on the handle? And I liked the look of it. I liked the feel of it. It was the biggest and heaviest one there, and that made me feel very tough. So I bought this one. And I'm going to put it down just there near my chair because the problem with it is it's so big and it's so heavy. Do you know what? Sometimes I don't feel that tough. And so what I needed was something to split wood when it doesn't need to be quite so big and heavy. And do you know what I could find? Exact baby one of the same thing. Can you see that? In fact, this one has a little safety guard on it so it's easier to carry around in a box. And can you see they look very, very similar? Once you've got two things that look the same, what does that mean? It's a collection. Absolutely. It has to be. That's the rules. So, I had two, and that meant that I needed uh, to have a collection. So, the next time I needed to cut some wood that wasn't splitting it, but actually cutting it, I needed a tomahawk or a hatchet. And guess what I went and bought? I bought this one. Can you see it's not the same shape head, because this is good for chopping, not for splitting. Same color. Fits in my collection. Isn't that good? This one has an even better... These are getting safer and safer as we go through, aren't they? Because this one now has a really good uh, guard on the blade. So there we are. There's my collection growing. And then I didn't actually know we already had this. But I was looking and needing to prune some roses. And do you know what my wife had bought? Some garden secateurs. And they're the same color still. They're the same color because they're actually all the same brand. And that's how advertising works, people. So this was part of my collection. And once, when you look at all those together, you can really clearly see that they do definitely fit. And it made me think a little bit about collecting things. And it made me realize, well, what about something that might be in the collection but might not look quite the same? Because actually, when I was a, a young boy, my dad had a hatchet that I remember very clearly because he actually cut his leg really badly while he was hiking in the mountains. And I don't have that one, but for my birthday this year, I bought one just like it. This was made probably when your grandparents were at school. So this is an old plum Boy Scout hatchet. A small, convenient. Back in the old days, you used to take that camping. We don't take them camping really anymore, certainly not on Pathfinder hikes. So we don't take that. But if you look at it, it, at first it feels like it doesn't fit the collection, doesn't it? But then you sort of think, well, actually, it doesn't have an orange handle, but it sort of fits the collection because it's a small axe, so maybe it does fit. And the last one here that I have to show you is this one. What does this look like? It looks, yeah, well, sort of the same, doesn't it? But... What's wrong with the handle? What's, look, at the, look at that, three nails. Three nails in the end because someone who owned this before didn't know how to look after it and so they weren't really very nice to it and I got this very cheap on Gumtree because what I'm actually going to do with it is put a new handle in it and I'm going to add it to my collection. Isn't that nice? Then I'll have even more in my collection and the thing that I'm trying to say is God also has collections. Did you know that? And do you know that in God's collection, we are all in his, in his collection? And sometimes we feel like we might be in His collection because we look the same. And then sometimes we realize that actually we're in God's collection even when we don't look the same. 
And did you know we're in God's collection, even if we're a bit old and have a cracked bit on our handle and some nails holding our head on? And we can still be in God's collection. And what's special about that is if we remember that everyone is part of God's collection, then that can actually help us remember to treat them like that, can't it? I think we'd be nicer to people if we remembered that they were in God's collection too. I hope so. So next time you see someone that's got nails holding their head on, <laughs> or just someone who feels like who you think might be a little bit on the outside, you can remind yourself, that person's in God's collection too. I might be friends with them. And that's what I wanted to tell you in my story. So I've got to pack my toys up in time to play the next piece with the band. So why don't you make your way back to your seats? Thanks for listening. Spirituals, as we know them, previously we called them Negro spirituals, but in the modern era, that's not done. We call them spirituals, African-American music. Where did it all start? Well, it started back with the slaves in the southern US. It's interesting that the slaves adopted the Christianity religion, even though they were slaves, to the people who were Christians and white. The blues songs went along with it. Blues talked about the hardships. There are many spirituals which have a very clear message about access to heaven through Christ. They figured that life as a slave was really terrible, which it was, but that if there was a heaven at the end of it, that made them feel more secure in their future. So out of that we got, you know, we have the blues alongside the spirituals. And coming into the 20th century, they developed another style of music as well, which was much faster. The gospel, the gospel songs, which had a much more upbeat tempo. So we've got the, the blues and the spirituals coming through the gospel songs. Out of that came the whole framework for Western popular music. The way all popular music since the 30s and the 20s is sung in the style of the spirituals and particularly the gospel songs of the 30s. So we owe a huge amount to the Christians who were slaves looking for a way to heaven. We're now going to play a piece called Jubilation, which is a collection of spirituals by a great composer and arranger. And we hope you enjoy them. You'll recognise many of them. Some are quite slow, some are quite quick, but that's the way of the gospel.
Oh, that is such a nice piece, isn't it? It's got a little bit of everything going on. That's the first time I've actually performed that somewhere. And uh, we really do enjoy that one here. Thank you. Yeah. The, um, as, we, as we think about today, so we can, we can think about many different things, thinking about October 22, 1844. And I guess, you know, as a church, we believe that Jesus was moving somewhere then. Well, I want to tell uh, a slightly different angle on Jesus moving, and I want to talk about the greatest movement that Jesus ever made. So um, we're looking at the empty tomb is what we're looking at, um, and we'll see how this... Yeah, there we go, the empty tomb. I believe it's actually the centre of the Christian faith. And, you know, if someone was to ask me, why am I a Christian? I'd just say simply, oh, the tomb's empty. It's a bit of a cryptic answer, I realise that, but actually it's actually packed with a whole lot of goodies as we think about that. You know, 1 Peter 3.15 says this, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give what? What is it? A defence. What's a defence? An apology, a reason. Have a reason for why that you believe what you do, for the hope that you have that's within you. And do that not with arrogance, not puffed up, not ready to sledge someone with a -a whack-a-mole game, you know, just to beat them down, but no, with what? With meekness and fear. Now, that fear is fear of what? Yeah, fear of dishonoring God, getting it wrong. It's just like, you you don't want to misrepresent God in that. We don't win people by winning arguments. But we do have a reason for our faith, and that's what I want to go on and explore a little bit. You know, there are many objections that people might have for the faith. They might say, oh, look, it's just a fairy tale. You know, there's so much violence that religion has brought into the world. There's so much evil and suffering. In fact, I'm reading a book at the moment called Travelling with God Through Pain and Suffering. It's an amazing read. If you, if you want to tackle into that subject, dig that book out. And one of the reasons why Christianity took off so well in the ancient times is because we had an answer for pain and suffering, which didn't deny our humanity and which integrated with who we are and gave us hope for the future. Glorious, glorious thing to think about. But, you know, there's all sorts of other reasons that people might have to say that, well, the reason for, for, for religion, you know, there is no God and so on. They're, they've got all sorts of excuses. Well, what I want to look at is, well, what is, is there any evidence for the empty tomb? And what sort of evidence would we really take? Like, like, was it really empty? I mean, did Jesus even get buried in a tomb? You know, some think that, that you know, they stole his body from the cross and, and, and whisked it away, and it was never actually in the tomb in the first place. And You know, and then how would we know and why does this even matter? Well, they're the kinds of questions hopefully today we'll be able to dig into a little bit. And here's what some people say. Now, these are liberal theologians. This is, again, quoting one of my favourite authors, Timothy Keller. And he says this. This is not Tim saying this. This is what liberal theologians. So who are liberal theologians? These are people who would say that they're Christian, but they deny miracles. So for them, resurrection is impossible, creation is impossible, so they're evolutionary in the thinking, and they're really only Christians because they like the social club, and they like the the nice moral values that go with that, but they're not really into the whole God thing as we might consider ourselves. This is what they say. There are many superstitious, miraculous elements in the Christian faith. Modern people can't believe these things actually happened. So if we're going to appeal to the modern world, we will have to reinterpret them as fiction, right? It's hard to believe that these people would call themselves theologians. Um, But fiction that preserves the essential principles of living that are in the Christian faith. All right, well, there we go. There's a nice thing they say, and they go on. They say, we can't believe in a literal, physical, historical resurrection anymore. It's just a fairy tale, is what they would kind of say. Ah, but we still have the idea of Easter. And I'm like, really? Oh, (laughs) doesn't nature itself teach you that after winter comes spring, that even in disaster and after death there can be a new beginning? Oh, how nice. Right? We water it all down till it's just a, a nice little story, but it actually has no hope. And that's one of the real problems with Christianity today. 
that we've actually watered down the real teachings of Scripture, that what it actually says to us anymore, people don't find any real meaning in that. So we've got to go back to what, what the Bible actually teaches. So um, the result is this, and this is Richard Niebuhr, and he described liberalism in this way. He said, a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a cross or of Christ without a cross. And he could have added on to that without a resurrection. In other words, if we actually water down Christianity to the point where there's no um, resurrection of Christ, there's no miracles that Jesus would have brought in this world, what have we got left? We've actually got nothing at all. In fact, the Apostle Paul, if you've got your Bible there, open it to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll look at that one first. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, and the Apostle Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17, he says, And if Christ is not risen, your faith is in vain or futile, and you're still in your sins, and, you know, well, you just might as well go out and just live a good life, you know, because this is all there is. So why waste it, you know, hanging in church when you could be jumping off a cliff this morning or doing some other rad thing, you know, whatever it is. But, of course, if it is true, Ha, huh, well, then we get the fairy tale as well, right? We get the happy ever after. We get not just now, but we get forever in God's kingdom. And that's kind of like pretty unique. If we look at First Peter, so first epistle of Peter, his first letter that he wrote, and we look at um, chapter 1 and verse 4, and this is what Peter says. He says that, well, we'll pick it up in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. There's that beautiful word, this resurrection that we want to explore. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. So here's the, why this matters. It's because it's talking about if Jesus is resurrected, then there's a future hope. But of course, if Jesus isn't resurrected, if the, team, if the tomb is still you know, there and it's still got a body somewhere, maybe we've identified the wrong tomb or whatever it is, then, then, you know, um, then maybe you know, all of this is in vain, but it's not. And this is what we want to explore. In other words, if Jesus' resurrection did not occur, we may as well live, live it up because this is all there is. The electrifying truth, though, is really quite different. This is the electrifying truth. That God's power has come from outside of history into this world, and Jesus died uh, for our sins in place so that through faith we can know His love and receive a guarantee of eternal life, all by grace as a gift. He also rose from the dead to bring into history the powers of the age to come. So it's like the future resurrection power of Christ is actually now a power that's made available to us right here, right now, in the here and now. And that every tear will one day be wiped away. So if we're talking about pain and suffering, then pain and suffering is going to be dealt a death blow. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be no more. And instead of that, we're going to have tears wiped away. There's going to be joy. There's going to be peace. There's going to be beautiful harmony in the universe. The electrifying truth actually goes on. It says, because Jesus' death for sin and resurrection happened in history, everything has changed. Absolutely everything. I want you to think about that. The center of Adventism is the movement of Jesus into this world through the life that he experienced, going to the cross. He resolutely went to the cross and there he entered the tomb and there on Sunday morning he was resurrected. That is the thing that changes everything. And the question is, what evidence is there that there, that there is an empty tomb? Well, look, can the Bible... Here's, a, here's an interesting question. Can we use the Bible for this sort of historical evidence? Well, the short answer is yes, but if we were going to do a pub test, one of the things in the pub test around this would be the question, well, look, the Bible is, you know, your religious book. How can you use your religious book to verify the facts of what's going on in history? Fair enough question? Yeah, it really is. So the longer answer is this. 
We have the Bible in this form, which is a collection of how many different books? And how many in the New Testament? A little more than 22. So there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians. This is where I get kind of muddled up about there. Then we go Titus, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, Hebrews, 1st, 2nd Timothy, 1st, 2nd Peter, Jude. uh, Philemon's in there somewhere in Revelation, right? There's 27 of them if we get them right. Pathfinders comes in handy, doesn't it? So there's 27 of them there. Now, those 27 are actually 27 different letters, different stories, different compilations written in different parts of an empire spread around the ancient Middle East, you know, all the way down from um, Alexander and Egypt, all the way around through to Rome and everywhere in between that sort of, sort of area is where these books were written as letters. So we only have it in our modern format because people actually thought these documents, these letters, were worthy of actually hanging on to. And then uh, within a couple of hundred years, they went, oh, wow, these documents are so important to us. We'll put it together in a codec or in a book. So now we have it there in a book. And so we don't even have to consider these to be inspired to prove our point. These could just be any ancient document. Right, So that's all we're going to consider them as, as just some sort of other ancient document, just like the writings of anyone else in ancient times. Now, here's my question for you. How do you pass on information if you don't have a computer? There's no tape recorder, there's no iPod, there's no iPhone, there's no paper wasn't invented, papyrus was expensive, scrolls were bulky and very costly. So how do you pass on? Story time. So, Miroslav, how would I know that um, you and Ruth got married? Just look at us. us. All right, there we go. All right. Rosalie, you and Breeze, how would I know that you, you, you are married and that you're not just living together and I shouldn't just go talk to Steve, the pastor of Memorial Church, and have a quiet word with him because you're living in sin? How would I know? Well, you've got documents. There, what, what was that word? There's witnesses, okay. And, and where could I... So, Breeze, you got any witnesses here who are at your wedding? Uh, so, who was that? David. So, can you testify? Absolutely. So, you were, you were there. You saw it happen. See, there we go. So, there's a, there's a testimony of someone else verifying and checking a fact. Is that important? Yeah, it kind of is. It's how we've always established facts in history, with witnesses. Does that make sense? And sometimes we do have documents, but if your house burns down and you lose all the documents, does that mean it didn't happen? Well, no. It just means, you know, we've got to maybe figure out how to prove that in other ways. So they passed on the incredible events that they witnessed through stories. Now, we give it a technical name, an oral tradition. And really, all that means is they cared so deeply about the stories of Jesus that they wanted to pass it on and they were careful about how they did it. And then we have creeds, and there's um, a number of creeds in the New Testament, which is kind of like a summary of the faith. And then, then they actually started writing them down into, into scrolls and codexes um, in, in parchment. Now, scrolls are really clunky. Codexes were a great innovation. It's the modern precursor to our books. And they started writing down in those kind of formats. It's really glorious. Just like we do. So... Let's have a look at some of the examples in um, a couple of different sources. So 1 Corinthians 15 again, we'll go back there because this is a ripper, right? The Apostle Paul, he says this, 
so 1 Corinthians was written, scholars, even liberal scholars, those kind of scholars who don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, those kind of scholars believe the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Corinthians, the letter to the Corinthian church. They believe that he did that um, within about 20, 30 years of the events that took place in Jerusalem where Jesus was allegedly crucified and buried in a tomb and resurrected. And here's what Paul says in this letter. So if you're talking 20 to 30 years later, are there witnesses around? Yeah, there really are witnesses around. I mean, when were you married, Brees? Oh, is this, is, is, um, how long have you been married? All right, so how many years? Yeah, lucky Rosalie, you, 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 you saved him, right? I was trying to see if he could remember how long you'd been married. But okay, so 53 years ago. Right, so, and David still remembers that, right? So 53 years, David remembers he was there. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. So here he's now picking up an oral tradition, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, who is Peter, then by the Twelve, and after that he was um, seen by over five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to this present so Paul's actually appealing to the fact there are witnesses to this who are still alive but some have fallen asleep some have died and after that he was seen by James the brother of Jesus then by all the apostles and last of all he was seen by me also as by one born out of time so Paul is actually saying here hey whatever you whatever you want to believe about this there's a whole heap of witnesses, and I'm one of those witnesses, I've seen the resurrected Jesus. It's like, ha, huh, that is an interesting story. And then we can go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Those stories are repeated, and with different angles, different nuances, by different people, in different places. So these are all witnesses, but if we actually look at the early church fathers, so who are they? Well, when Paul went to... Um, a place, he would appoint someone to be the leader of that new church he raised up. So Peter, when he was in Rome, he appointed Clement to be the, the, the pastor in charge of the church there in Rome. We call it a bishop in, in terms of scripture, but the, the title bishop is really that of a pastor or a church leader along those sort of lines, and Peter appoints Clement. So Peter and Clement were alive together. And Clement was around 330 to 100 AD, and he'd seen the other, some of the other apostles and Peter, and he writes various letters from which he confirms some of the facts that he's heard. Irenaeus, um, writing around 185 AD, affirms that Clement had seen the apostles. And by extension, not only had seen the apostles, but had, um, had heard the stories of the resurrection. And then you've got Polycarp, who was taught by the Apostle John and, um, and some of the other Apostles and he'd seen them and he'd actually um, had also seen the, um, he'd seen many people who had actually bore witness to the fact of the resurrection. So here is, it's kind of like we've got Breeze and Rosalie's wedding, David was there, Breeze and Rosalie are no longer with us and David's there and, and Julianne, David's daughter, is actually now remembers from David the story that's been passed on to her that Breeze and Rosalie were once married. Now, of course, weddings don't matter nearly so much as something that's earth-shattering like a resurrection. You imagine how fantastic a story that is. Especially in a culture where they didn't believe in resurrection. They believe when you're dead, that's it, you're done. In fact, one of the ways in which Greek people used to deal with pain and suffering with their stoicism, they used to say this. They, they would cuddle their kids together at, at bed at night and they would say, oh, God bless you, you know, it's been a wonderful day today and tomorrow you will die. And it was their stoic way of actually bracing themselves to the fact that life is so contingent, one moment you're here, next moment you're not, and that's it. Then you're done. And it's like Christianity comes in and says, well, actually, there's resurrection. You think that would be an earth-shattering piece of information, and people are going to be arguing about that. So in the special case of Paul, in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, we get... 
Uh, in Acts 8, Paul hates the early Christian church. That's his own testimony. He hates them so much that he's rounding them up and trying to throw them in prison. And then in Acts chapter 9, he turns around and says he, he has an encounter with Jesus. And then in that encounter with Jesus, he's so transformed. He's just like, wow, Jesus really is resurrected. I got it wrong. And so Paul then has this whole change of experience. It's a powerful and it's a radical transformation that Paul goes through. Now, here's another piece of the puzzle if we think about it, the disciples become martyrs. How many of them become martyrs is a little bit up for some historical debate. We think the vast majority of them were, except for the Apostle John, and that's only because they couldn't actually kill John. They tried to kill him in a vat of oil, and he refused to die, so they got him out of that. It just would have been horrendously painful, and he lived out um, his life in old age. So here's the thing. Paul was beheaded... Peter and Andrew were crucified. Peter was crucified, according to tradition, upside down. Thomas was stabbed with spears and John, you know, with severe wounds until his old age. Now, their own testimony is that they were cowards. So when Jesus was crucified on the cross, what, would, what did the disciples do? They forsook him and fled. Peter denied him three times. I mean, and then when all of those events were, you know, Jerusalem was in uproar and the disciples were cowering in the upper room and they're just terrified. The doors are bolted shut. And in the middle of that, some crazy women come knocking on the door saying Jesus is resurrected and they're like, go away. And Peter runs and he sees that the tomb's empty and he comes back and he says, the tomb's empty, what's it mean? And then they have this encounter with Jesus. And they go from overnight being absolute cowardly men to bold so that it doesn't matter. You know, you, you tell us not to preach, we're going to preach. You tell us that you're going to kill us, well, bring it on because we're going to preach anyway. Who does that unless there's some real compelling internal change that's taken place in them? But then we've got this crowd of witnesses. So I just want you to think about who was there to actually witness the death of Jesus. There were the crowds of people milling around in Jerusalem. How many of those? Well, there's upwards of hundreds of thousands of people. It was Pentecost. It's the big religious festival. Now, we see the equivalent of these kinds of movements of people, mass movements of people in the Islamic world when they come to gather at Ramadan and for the, the giant festival there where they, they have a pilgrimage to, to Mecca and, and here they gather around and worship, right? So in that space, just think, thousands of pilgrims coming from all over the ancient world to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And here Jesus is crucified outside the gate so that they can all witness that as they come and go. Then there's the priests, their witnesses. Then there are the disciples, their witnesses. There's women who are witnesses as well, although their testimony technically doesn't count. There are soldiers who are witnesses to this. Then there's Nicodemus and Josephus who asked for the body of Jesus. They're witnesses to this. And they're rulers in the Sanhedrin. So that's kind of like the equivalent here in Australia would be there in the Senate or the House of Representatives in the national government. You know, they're, they're the elite of the elite, only not like our politicians. They're far more wealthy than our politicians. Um, fabulously wealthy. Then there's Pilate, the governor, and of course the rest of the Sanhedrin. So there's, there's quite a list of witnesses there. And if we were to look at, well, who are the witnesses to the empty tomb? Now, of course, we have this term that we use today called fake news. Okay, who invented that phrase, fake news? Donald Trump. Okay, so he's, he's got this term, fake news. Now, in order for something to be fake news, um, you have to be able to convince everyone everywhere that this actually hasn't happened. So the first witness to, to this is Mary and um, another woman who were not really told who it was. And, you know, they went there and saw the tomb was empty. Mary stayed. She hugged Jesus. She went back, told the others. Now, in ancient times, women were not valid witnesses to anything of significance. Their testimony wasn't considered valid. So if you're going to be making a story up, you don't have as your key witness a woman. You with me? Sorry about that, but it's just the way it was, right? And this is one of the key elements of the story that gives authenticity 
to the story because a woman is actually the first to be there at the tomb. Now, of course, first, well, actually, there was another group who were there as well, and that were the Roman soldiers. Why were they there? They were there because the, the religious leaders had heard that Jesus said he'll destroy this temple and raise it again in three days. So they put a guard on the tomb to make sure that no one stole the body. Great for us. Not so good for the Roman soldiers. When the, tomb, when the stone rolled away and Jesus came out, incredible event. The Roman soldiers are witnesses. Then we've got the disciples as they run to the tomb and see the tomb is empty and then have encounters with Jesus afterwards. Then you've got Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They're witnesses because on the one hand they put the body in there. They know where the body was and now these are leaders of the ruling elite and they notice the body's gone and they see and they investigate and they discover that the story is established by so many other witnesses that it's like, wow, this really did happen. Then we have the priests and now all the priests needed to do was produce a body. That's all they needed to do, to shut the disciples up, to, to make the whole thing go away. They just needed to produce a body, but they couldn't produce a body. Why? The body was resurrected. The Sanhedrin, all, that's all they needed to do. The crowds were there, and the crowds were witnesses to all of these events taking place in the city, which by now was in absolute uproar as people were talking about this sensational event that had just taken place. And then, of course, Pilate and the governor, with his wife having the dream, don't get involved in this, and now Pilate is there, and now he's aware of everything that's just taken place. And all he needed to do to make the whole thing go away was still just produce a body. And even when they brought the disciples in and, and, and whipped Peter and John for, for preaching, all they needed to do was just produce a body, but they couldn't. So all of that goes on. And so what's it actually saying? Here is the pub test. There's too many sources of info. There's a political and police cover-up. It's very embarrassing. And there's way too many witnesses. It's too fantastic. You don't make this kind of stuff up. You can't make it up. Even women were witnesses. You wouldn't make that up. You'd have Joseph of Arimathea being the one to discover the tomb. And all scholars agree that the tomb is empty. Even the liberal scholars they just try and come up with a different way of proving it. So why does all of this matter? Because Peter says this. He says, For we did not follow cleverly invented tales, stories, myths, when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus. Jesus in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And church, I want to encourage you that just as there was a movement of Jesus back then in time, there was a movement of Jesus in 1844, we are awaiting a mighty movement of Jesus who's going to come in power to save us. So don't give up hope. Don't let anyone in society sledge you and think, oh, it's just a made-up story. This is uh, the most amazing piece of historical evidence that... Um, really demonstrates so clearly that Jesus is our resurrected King. Crown him the King of glory, the Lord of love. And he says to us to call him our Father. At the end of each verse of this hymn, the band will play an interlude and I will bring you in for each verse. Oh, 
Father, we just want to thank you so much that Jesus entered this world, that he conquered death and suffering, that he is resurrected, and that because of his resurrection, we have hope of life forever with you. Our Lord, bless us, increase our faith and our understanding, be with us until we meet again, give us opportunities to share your faith with others, we pray in your name, amen.
to the brass band for blessing us today. Haven't you been blessed? Can I see your hands? May the Lord bless us as we go now, and uh, you're all invited for lunch here at the back. Thank you, and God bless.